Catherine. Okay. We'll give it a little time for the attendees to, to filter in. Andy, Joe, for some reason, your, your voice is really, really loud. And I have my volume turned down a little bit. Um, it's it's oh. very, I'll just say piercing, but I'm not sure what's causing it because usually it's not. Now? now I can't hear you at all. You can't hear me at all now. <laughs> at all, because it was a different microphone. Um, Okay, can you hear me now? And is that better, Pam? I'm not sure people can hear me now. I can hear we you, can. sounds good to me. We can hear you, it sounds great. Okay, uh, Pam, but Pam cannot, it sounds like. Ooh. Pam, can you hear us? I don't think Pam can hear anyone now. Um, Speak, Pam. <laughs> can't hear you. She can't hear anyone. Okay, I'll so try to just. Touch with yeah, so we will wait to figure that one out. While we're waiting to figure that out, can I just say I'm on the road? I was supposed to travel tomorrow, but because of snow conditions, I'm having to leave the house today. So okay. I'm in the car. Um, okay, but I will be here listening for this. Okay. Thank you for that, Shalini. We're mm -hmm. gonna wait for Pam. I think Pam just left to maybe come back in. Yes. So we will figure this out for the attendee in the audience. I apologize for the delay. We'll get this all figured out before we start. Can you hear us now, Pam? She can't hear a thing. I'm trying to get in touch with her now. Yep, I'm, I'm texting her. I wonder if she has her ear um, phones plugged in. Sometimes when I have my earphones plugged in, my computer doesn't sound like anything. And then mm. I plug my earphones and there's the sound. Yeah. So we just saw you mute that one. Can you hear us through the other one, Pam? Yes. Okay. <laughs> very weird. This is very weird. Very strange. So I think we can all hear each other now. So with that um, and seeing the, the people I'm expecting are here. So I am going to at 4.39 p.m. Uh, call the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council meeting to order. It is February 24th, 2022, and this is a regular meeting. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by a technological means. At this time, I am going to take um, a roll call to make sure people can hear me and the rest of us and that everyone we can hear everyone too. I think we've solved that issue, but we're gonna confirm that. Um, I'm just gonna go down my list here and call on people as I see them for our committee. Jennifer Taub. Present. Uh, Pam Rooney. Present. Shalini Balmilne. Present. Mandy Johanneke is present. Pat DeAngelis will not be attending today. 
Um, with that, we're going to go right into this. Um, we have basically a hard end time at 6.30, um, but um, when we get about halfway through after the discussion items, I will actually be passing the chair gavel, virtual gavel, over to the vice chair, Pam, to, to run the general public comment, the minutes, the announcements, the next agenda preview, and any items not anticipated before we adjourn the meeting um, to give her some experience. And also because I have a meeting that starts exactly at 6.30. Um, so I am juggling meetings myself today. Um, so I appreciate that Pam is willing to take over the gavel for those portions of the meeting. We're hoping to get to them around six. Um, We'll start with action items, which is also technically a trans, it's a discussion with potential actual action on it, which is the transition memo. I put two items on this, the planning priorities um, with possible recommendations to the council, and then um, to talk about the conversation topics in the transition memo. Um, and we had talked last meeting about potentially making recommendations to the council to refer some of those topics to TSO to put them on their agenda and off of our agenda. So um, I'm actually gonna start with the conversation topics, even though it was listed second, so that we can potentially see how long that one takes and then maybe get that one over with and move on to the regular planning priorities. Um, so the conversation topics that um, we had been discussing um, in particular were, um, there were two that related, we thought, to TSO, and they were, when, when my document comes up, they were related to the closing of public ways during the summer, potentially, and then um, the use of the public way for outdoor dining. Um, I may not have worded them the way the transition memo words them, but that's what they were. Um, is there a any discussion on those or other items that were in the transition memo um, in terms of thoughts on making a recommendation to town council about which committee should deal with these, if any, because the recommendation could be that we sort of table those topics completely too. Um, so any thoughts? Um, I know Shalini may not be able to easily raise her hand. Um, there are only four of us um, otherwise, but we'll, we'll try and make it work. Um, with people who want to talk. Pam? Yeah, I think um, the idea of a street closure is, to me, is sort of a community event. It doesn't really feel like CRC as a, as a topic to hash out and work through the details. So I know that there are um, either opportunities within, maybe maybe within TSO, just because it is street related to um, pass it to them. I'm not trying to pass off work, but um, seems seems maybe more appropriate to go that direction. And the staff, the staff that supports TSO, you know, is DPW. It's all the it's all the the staff entities that really would need to help make it happen. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on those two? Jennifer? Um, yes, I, I would agree. I mean, it doesn't, it seems like it would be more appropriate in the TSO. It also seems to fall a bit under um, town services, maybe more than zoning and planning. Mm -hmm. How has it been done in the past? Um, you know, I'm not sure that the council has actually had a discussion of it in the past, um, which is why it was probably brought up in my, um, by a former or current, I'm, I'm not sure it could have been Shalini or I, um, or another CRC member that, that put it on the agenda. It was on the potential future agendas to talk about. Um, it made it into the transition memo, but I'm not sure it's ever been talked about by any actual committee or the council as a whole. Um, but just sort of one of those, hey, ideas that would be good to discuss type things. Jennifer? So would the, does the planning department have a preference or? 
opinion. <laughs> uh, you're asking if they have a preference or opinion on which committee? No, I mean, where, where they would think, I guess it's for us, um, <laughs> whether they, they think it's more of a, <laughs> maybe transportation or. I mean, they are the use of the, the public years. way. So that's, yeah. that's why I think we had been settling on maybe it needs to go to TSO as they discuss uses of the public way and stuff. Shalini, and then Chris. Oh, Chris can go first. Okay, Chris. So I don't want to put words in Rob's mouth, but Rob might want to talk about the issue of outdoor dining and which group he wants that to go to because he's the one who's most involved in that. The planning department is actually only peripherally involved in outdoor dining at this point. Rob, do you have any thoughts? I'll just say that, you know, my involvement with what has happened out in the public way gets into issues like um, having enough access for bus turning uh, movements, um, fire department access to buildings, uh, where to relocate bike paths. So to me, it seems like what is being suggested so far makes sense that they're, they're definitely overlapping TSO issues that um, probably you know, work on the whole picture where we're normally just focused on, you know, the layout of the dining in relation to the building or the, the, the rest of the use. Thank you for those thoughts, Rob. Shalini, did you want to, you took your hand down, so. Yeah, I just wanted to hear from the staff and uh, which we did. And I agree that uh, it feels more of a town services and outreach issue. And I think it's an important one because we're trying to revitalize downtown. So um, I think it's an important issue though. So someone should be discussing it. Thank you, Shalini. So given what everyone said, I'm just gonna make a motion. And that motion is to recommend the town council refer to the town services and outreach committee conversations regarding economic development and the use of public space, including the potential for closing North Pleasant Street in summers on the weekends and the continuation of outdoor dining. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, Jennifer seconds that. Athena, was that slow enough for you to get that? Almost, sorry. <laughs> I was making it up on the fly. So <laughs> I got off of the transition memo. Let me see if I can do it again. Use of public space and the use of, I miss the streets. Um, let me get back to the transit. Um, so it was use of the public, so economic development and the use of the public space, including the closing, um, including the possibility of closing North Pleasant Street in summers on the weekends and the continuation of outdoor dining. Thank you. I got that. Okay. We have a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. Um, Shalini. Yes. Uh, Jennifer. Yes. And Pam. Yes. And Mandy is an aye. That is a four zero vote as I make notes myself. So I will put that in a, um, in a report to the town council um, for that. And okay. And with that, we're going to move on to the transition memo. Um, the second item of under this, which is planning priorities. Um, we started this discussion three weeks ago, I think was our last meeting. Um, and so this is a continuation of that discussion. We received from Chris Brestrup a list of um, the planning department's priorities um, for 2022 two zoning bylaw amendments um, and what they were looking at for phase one and phase two. Um, and so I wanna thank the planning department for providing that. It was a great summary of, I think, what we discussed a couple weeks ago um, at this meeting and where the planning department was. And it was great at least to see what, what they're thinking, what you're thinking of for phase two. 
um, and all. I want to, before we start a conversation, I want to recognize Shalini if she's ready. She had wrote to me with a potential um, uh, suggestion on how to work through coming up with zoning priorities. So I thought I would recognize her to talk about that. It would mean that we don't get to making any recommendations today, but um, but I thought we'd start with her suggestion to see where this committee stands because that, that would then um, uh, formulate and, and you know, the rest of our conversation. So Shalini. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, Joe, uh, what I was uh, recommending is that we create some sort of a matrix where we come together as a com committee, what are the criteria by which we can assess the different uh, priorities. And this would matrix would be to help us prioritize our priorities. It's kind of what we discussed in the retreat that uh, we could, of put certain criteria, like how are these different um, priorities impacting our different goals, like our economic goals, our social justice goals, environment goals, um, housing, uh, housing goals, uh, the community over at large is, and then what are the origins of this? Is it from coming from the planning staff? Is it a priority of the staff, the last town council or um, resident raise, and then we could include cost. Like, do we need to hire a consultant? What would be the cost? What would be the staff time? And I think if you start putting all the different priorities in those boxes, I think it would give us some a shared language to talk about and get us to even see a big picture of what all is involved. So just thoughts about that. I'd love to hear from the group thoughts about that and what criteria we might use to create such a matrix. So let's start with thoughts um, to see if this committee um, can reach consensus on whether that would be a good idea on how to approach creating zoning priorities or making recommendations for zoning priorities. And if the committee reaches consensus there, we will move on to potential criteria to put into a matrix. Um, so thoughts on Shalini's suggestion about creating a matrix for us to help analyze um, sort of the suggestions we've received for zoning changes. I see Jennifer unmuted. Jennifer. Are these specifically zoning changes or planning? I mean, I guess I'm looking at planning priorities is what's. Yeah, so, so I guess it's both, right? It, it would be things within the planning, zoning, master plan type thing that fall within um, our, uh, generally fall within CRC's purview. I'm leaving housing out because we have a separate referral for the comprehensive housing policy. Although I will say if we like this approach for the planning side, I will suggest it in the next conversation in the second half of this meeting on how to potentially approach figuring out implementation of the comprehensive housing policy. Um, but they would probably be two different matrices. I guess I'm grappling with is housing separate from the planning and zoning. I mean, or at all because in the comprehensive how policy does talk about planning and zoning. I, I guess I'm I'm just thinking out loud, but I'm thinking out loud is perfectly fine in this committee. <laughs> well, I did think the comprehensive housing policy did actually get into some discussions of zoning or it, it touched on, you know, zoning that would need to be yeah. changed or whatever to make the housing policy happen. Yes. Yeah, so there is definitely in that sort of appendix to the comprehensive housing policy, a whole list of potential zoning things. Um, I, I am at this point treating them separately because the transition memo is not, and the planning stuff and anything mentioned within that, that's how we sort of started this conversation, is not a formal referral to CRC at this point. Um, whereas the implementation of the comprehensive housing policy is. Um, and so, so that's why I've got them separate, even though I completely understand what we decide to, how we decide to implement the housing policy definitely will prob well, will probably have some sort of zoning 
um, effects, right? Because a lot of the potential implementation methods is through zoning. And so maybe in the end, we can't separate them. Right now I'm trying to, it might not work. <laughs> um, Chris. So I'm uh, asking a question about where do you, um, where do you start? In other words, where's the list of things that you would put into the matrix and then assign criteria or check off boxes having to do with criteria related to these things? And, and I'm imagining, this is what I'm imagining, that you would go to your transition memo and look at the things that didn't get accomplished last year and think about whether you wanted to put those in the matrix. And then you might look at the planning department priorities, maybe you would put those into the matrix. And then would you go back and um, we created a matrix for the planning board. And I can't remember if we sent it to you or not, listing all of the different things we studied or looked at last year and stating what the status was. And some of those things we wanna go back to and some we may not wanna go back to, but. I guess those are three sources that I would imagine you would pull your things that you put into your matrix from. And I wondered if you could comment on that. So yeah, if we go with the matrix um, method, I would start with all three things that you just identified. Um, so so the, the planning department priorities, phase one, phase two would definitely go into that matrix. The stuff listed in the transition memo would go into the matrix. Um, that list, I believe you, you just referenced regarding the zoning priorities from the last council that you provided to the planning board, I think was in our last packet. Um, so that would go into it. But the other thing that would definitely go into it is anything that I saw from the council retreat in the council, the councilors um, took up some, um, they took up some, uh, at the retreat, each councilor made a list of their own priorities and that was created into a document. So I would go through that document to see whatever planning items were there. And from there, I would add all of those too. Um, when we did this three years ago, we had a list, um, or two years ago, I guess it was, we had that list. Um, I, I think maybe Chris and Rob and even maybe Nate would remember, we started with some big matrix where we got some ideas from the planning board, from counselors. Um, we pulled the counselors actually and, and had people send me ideas to put in the matrix from, from the planning department. And then we weren't sure what to do with it was the problem, right? Um, we had this whole list and then we struggled getting it down to what to, to recommend the council take on or in, in terms of priorities. Um, and so we'd start with that big list, but maybe once we had the criteria, that was the issue last time, we didn't really settle on criteria to evaluate. Um, so that's my thinking on having thought about this for exactly like two hours when I finally read Shalini's email. So, um, Pam. And I've thought about it for exactly zero hours. So um, it is, it's helpful to put everything into a, uh, into a list. And I think doing so helps you sort of a uh, big picture of everything that's on the table. Um, it's a bigger list than we're gonna get accomplished. Um, and I think so many of the items right now are interrelated. And so I think the planning department, the planning board, um, and they're, they're sort of the emergencies that need to get addressed. And, and I think, would, I would say solar bylaw is probably one of those. So that's on everybody's list. Um, I, I wouldn't mind helping put this matrix together. Um, I think the ball right now is, is rolling down the track on a couple of key items, um, but it certainly does not hurt to, um, to document in one place kind of what's, what's on the plate. So in that sense, I think it's a fine idea. Um, I, I would have to give it a lot more thought on what criteria would, would be a, you know, why does, why does item A get 
uh, a higher rating than uh, item B. And some of that is in the eye of the, of the beholder. So um, I think it's a good, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think it would take a fair amount of work to add the little bit of details, but it may in fact give us a pretty good perspective of at least the range of, of subjects that we feel we should be working on. Thank you, Pam. Nate. Sure, thanks. I was just gonna to respond to um, Jennifer when you asked the planning priority list that Chris sent, you know, phase one and phase two, that those were zoning amendments. You know, I know, was, you know, one or two of them may not have been, you know, directly, for instance, like the downtown design standards, but you know, ideally that would result in zoning. Uh, same with, um, you know, possibly some of the parking studies. But in terms of what was on that list, I mean, some of those things are, are underway and really are things that the planning department are actively working on. So the flood mapping, uh, the solar uh, bylaw and assessment, um, you know, Article 14, uh, demolition delay, and, and, and number two, uh, phase two below breweries, wineries, and distilleries, we have a technical assistance grant from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to assist with that um, this calendar year. So, I mean, those are zoning amendments that are, you know, actively moving forward. Um, and then, you know, there's additional studies and projects that may result in some, but, you know, what we have going on right now are, you know, six, you know, six amendments or so that are actively being worked on. Um, and so, you know, our thought is those are the ones that are priority right now, they're, act they're active. And then what else is there, you know, whether it's from the comprehensive housing policy or other priorities in the town, you know, what else, you know, become, you know, phase one or phase two. Okay, thank you, Nate. Uh, Dave. Yeah, so just to follow up on what Nate said, and yeah, a couple of things. So, um, you know, I'm interested in the matrix idea. I, I have to say it, it makes me a little nervous um, because I think of time and and I just worry a little bit about where where we go with this and how much time it takes and how realistic we are, you know, with all of our time. Um, that said, Nate just outlined six or eight things that, you know, and I've had this conversation with Nate and Chris and Rob, and, and I think I mentioned it before, with what we currently believe are the priorities, then Nate outlined many of them right just a moment ago, that's six to eight months. We're, there's not a lot of bandwidth other than those six or eight items, you know, in the, in the, in the planning department for the town. So I think we have to be very realistic about what it is we're, we're gonna undertake here. And, and maybe those are phase one and, and this matrix helps us identify phase two, which might come maybe late in 2022 or in 2023. Um, the other thing I just wanna keep in mind is that, you know, we, we have to figure out how, how does the CRCs slash council's priorities get um, funneled into the town manager's priorities, if you will, because we, we just, there needs to be an interface between what the council wants to do and Paul's, prior, Paul's your goals and objectives for Paul. Um, because all of, a lot of these initiatives too have budgetary implications. So to think we can start, you know, A, B or C now, we may not have the consultant money until FY24 to do it. So, so there's a lot of moving parts. Um, I know we're gonna talk about implementation in a few minutes as well, but you know, I'm keenly interested in, in kind of what the current council this, through you, the CRC, think is the council's role in implementation versus what is staff's role in implementation. Um, and I think Chris is prepared to talk as an example about the comprehensive housing um, policy and, and what we're doing to implement some of those strategies. So those are just some of my, my I guess their concerns is, and the main one is kind of time. It, it sounds like a reset to me and maybe I'm in, and maybe there needs to be a reset, but it seems like we, we set the table for a lot of these back in the last three years. And some of them we got done, I think there were seven 
that were um, approved by the council in 2021. And we, you know, there are new people on the council, so it, it may need to be reset. But resetting is going to take some time and may just slow things down. So thank you for those comments and thoughts, Dave. Jennifer. Yeah, I, so that I, you know, share a lot of what you, you said that we, we have a new council, you know, different people, you know, may have some different ideas, but that we probably, you know, don't want to go back to square one. I mean, I think that the comprehensive housing policy has a lot there. And we, I mean, I know that that's housing isn't the only thing CRC addresses, you know, I think we're all concerned about downtown revitalization and, you know, looking maybe at design standards, but I feel like go, you know, which we may get to today, but going through the comprehensive housing policy and really how we implement the, the, the policy and in each part of it can keep us pretty busy, <laughs> you know? And I think that, I also think there's probably a lot of agreement on the overall goals or, you know, probably almost every goal of the housing policy or a lot of them, but how we get there may be where, you know, we have to, we, we, you know, we have to work through. But yeah, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't know that we have to sort of recreate because I think that we could, I don't know, I, I'm talking saying both things, but I, I went through the housing policy and I just thought there was a lot there. And, you know, when I wrote a lot of notes and of which I'm sure we all did, but I felt, I feel like between downtown revitalization, design standards, everything Nate said you're already doing and going through the housing policy, that's, that's a lot in yeah. the next two years. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Pam. I was gonna say, I would be, uh, I, I actually don't know that we need to talk about it much more today. Um, I think it's a good concept. I would be happy to work with Shalini. Um, I'd be happy to, to pull all these pieces together and dump them into a matrix and see if there's some overlaps and some opportunity for um, you know, different, different organizations to be kind of working on different threads of the same uh, topic. And maybe we see where, where some of those uh, connections can be made a little more clearly than people kind of already you know, subconsciously understand um, so I would say, you know, put my name down to start taking a look at the list that Nate read off and Christine mentioned and, you know, the transition carryovers, the, the, the planning department list, the planning board list, the council retreat items, and even I added, you know, some of the master plan items that we're all supposed to be working towards as well. So, um, um, I don't mind tabling this conversation and coming back to it after we've actually all had a chance to think about it, um, but would be happy to see if there is some semblance of order in, in helping put that list out for consumption. So that's it. Thank you, Pam. Shalini. Uh, so what I'm hearing from Dave, can you hear me? Because I have yes, a mask can. on now. Okay, yes. I'll turn on the video. Hello. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm hearing Dave say is that there's already a list for the staff to tackle. And so I just want to reaffirm that what I was proposing is not to say, don't do that. We're going to create our own list and that's what you need to do. The list is more for the group to have a conversation around priorities and the staff Priorities, those are already a priority and we know that. So maybe Dave, as you said, that might be phase two, but when we do get around to having a conversation, it'll give us something to talk about, have the same language to talk about. And I'm happy to work with uh, uh, Pam also and, uh, you know, to, to whenever we do have a conversation that we start putting things in and it's not for the staff to create the matrix. This is something that the CRC will be doing to facilitate our own internal conversations. So uh, we can just start, Pam and I can maybe start organizing and putting things down. And then when we do need to have that conversation, we'll have a starting point. Thank you, Shalini. So here's, here's what we're gonna do. Um, I am going to have Shalini 
I cannot assign this to two people without that be, being created as a subcommittee. So I'm going to say that right now. Thank I'm you, going Mary. to ask, <laughs> Athena knows where I'm going with this. I'm going to ask Shalini to work on a matrix. I'm going to tell her that she can um, bring in pretty much anyone she wants to help her with that, as long as it eventually comes from Shalini to me to put in a packet. Um, and so we, our next meeting is slated for the third, that is unreasonable to think. And um, given the other things I've heard, which is we've got this phase one, phase two from the planning department in conversations that we've had as CRC, um, I, I am under the impression that CRC supports that list and is not looking to remove anything from that list. And all we've been told is that that list will keep you guys busy for six months or more. Um, and so I'm going to view this matrix as an ongoing thing to be ready for a phase two, to be ready for a, um, as we do these conversations, to be ready for uh, manager goals when we get to those goals later in the year and things like that. Um, so that, you know, the first time CRC tried this, it took months, right? This is, this is not something that's done in one or two months. We want to be ready for when planning department frees up some time, um, to know what to move on to and in what order this council wants to. So I, I'm going to say Shalini can work on that, that matrix will have there at various points when we're ready, um, we'll bring that matrix in. Um, to the council, to, to, to the CRC, to have those discussions. Um, I know Athena wants to say something about open meeting law, so I'll let her say that. Athena. Um, thanks, Mandy. <laughs> Just want to point out that if, Michelle, if you reach out to more than one person, then that's a, a quorum of the committee. So you can pick one person. <laughs> Thank you for, for that, in, For input before it comes back to the committee. <laughs> yes. So, but, but it, formally is assigned to just Shalini. Um, and then when you're ready for it to be brought, I'll, I'll be in touch with Shalini about timing on agenda for that, um, but it will not be on at least the next agenda because that's an unreasonable amount of time to try and get it done in less than a week for the packet and for us to consider. Um, so we will keep this sort of, I'll probably rename it on future agendas, um, but we will, figure out when the next logical time to to bring this to the council is Shalini. Okay, so just to clarify, I can only reach out to one person. So that's clear. Now, if people want to send me their ideas, well, that that's also not allowed. Like I'm not reaching one out person. to them. Only one person. Okay, thank if, you. If, if, yeah, so, so just one person, um, because once you are the recipient of many ideas, you're the one in violation ah. of open meeting law. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so one person, we can do check-ins regularly at CRC for those conversations to happen. If you're like, you know, we really need input on X and that's what we'll limit the discussion to, or we need input on Y, the criteria or something, that's what we need things on we can we can have those discussions in crc at future meetings in in those formats um is everyone clear sort of on where we're going to go with that part of this um trying to help schedule and figure out where to put council time um paul's goals and all which will help gol as they formulate the next set of priorities for paul too um and all and then that as we know, translates down into generally the planning department priorities through Paul's um, goals and all. Any further, uh, Shalini? Just one last thing about the goals that Dave talked about. And uh, that was the, the criteria that I was hoping to include in the matrix would be based on uh, the town manager's goals. Like how are these changes? And those town manager goals are basically our council goals that we've adopted um, or values. So those would be used to create the criteria. So thanks. Thanks. Okay. Moving on to our next agenda item, which is the comprehensive housing policy implementation. And so this one, is on our agenda because it's actually one of our referrals. Um, oh, Shalini, you are not muted yet. Do you still, do you have something to say? Yes. 
No. no. Okay. I'm I'm trying to I can't find the microphone. I'm sorry. I'm trying to mute. I, I totally I understand. I didn't know whether you're you're, you're yeah. trying to do 20 things. I just wanted to make sure you knew you weren't muted. Um so this is one that has been referred to the town manager and to CRC for implementation, and that is the extent of the referral. So that means, as Dave hinted, we as CRC have to figure out in conjunction with the town staff um, through the manager, but I think Dave will help us with that the contact since he's our town staff liaison here, um, how to implement and what that means. And I think he hit on sort of the first item, which is who implements or how do we determine it? Um, we had a lot of potential implementation strategies, right, in this document, that appendix has a lot of information. And so um, the first thing I think we should be talking about, although I'll open it up for general conversation on um, implementation in general, but not necessarily specific strategies is um, what is the council's role in implementation? What is staff's role? And how do we, at, or and other town committees, we did receive today um, from the chair of the housing trust, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, their thoughts, it was sent to the whole council um, as a information document. They have come up with their implementation priorities based on our guidelines and they have informed us of those. Um, so they took on some initiative to say, hey, we're part of this conversation. The councils put this policy out. What can we do to help implement that policy? And so that's one, one um, cog in a many wheel implementation strategy. Um, but I, I'm going to open it up and not just to the counselors on this committee. I would love to hear thoughts from the planning staff that are here about implementation too, um, because you know I it, there's a lot going on in that policy, um, and so the thoughts from the staff will help us inform our discussion about how we implement the policy over many years, short term, long term, and all. So, Chris. So I thought it might be um, helpful to give a, like a status report about where we are. So then we can figure out where we're going from there. So I have some information to share with you if you will bear with me for a little while. Great. Um, okay. And Dave has his hand up. So I don't know whether he wanted to say something before me or. Um... I think he just took it down. So he, he's good with you no. first, I think. <laughs> no, actually, no, I was going to see if before. Oh, okay. As I know, Chris and I talked about what she was going to say earlier, but yeah, no, I just wanted to say a few things. So, um, no, Mandy, I appreciate you framing this the way you did. And, you know, I think the way I look at this and the way Paul looks at this is that, um, you know, by and large, the council sets policy for the town. The town, uh, the, the council works with the town manager and sets, in this case, his goals. And then it's up to Paul for, for Paul to really set the, the wheels in motion to make sure that there's enough staff and that the budgets are adequate to achieve some of the goals. So as we look at this document, um, I would say by and large, we look at the heavy lifting of, of the implementation being done by staff. Where we need the council's help is anywhere that this the implementation uh, section touches zoning or touches policy. Um, and there's a number of areas that, that uh, we've already achieved some, some success in, in this document, and there's more that Chris will talk about. But I think that's where we see the interface between what we do day in, day out. I mean, Nate is, our, is, is, a, is a staff person, a senior planner who spends about probably 60 to 70% of his time on housing. And Chris will talk about uh, the CPA funding where we hope to bring on another part-time planner. But we see the implementation of this document largely falling to the planning department to work with other departments within town, to work with the housing trust. Of course, John Hornick and, and the team at the housing trust were working extremely well with them, but also with, with DPW, with, with a number of different agencies, with the, with the um, with the um, housing authority and with uh, a number of local and regional partners. So that's kind of the framework with which we see this document. 
And, and the interface we see with the council and with CRC is where do we need zoning help um, and where do we need policy help to make changes, to make, uh, to, to produce more units uh, across the board, but also more affordable units. So that was just kind of the quick intro I wanted to give and then turn it over to Chris and she can walk us through the different sections to give you kind of a, a sense of where we are in those sections. Cause it's, it's actually pretty exciting. Um, uh, some of the things that we've already achieved. So thanks. Thank you, Dave. Chris. Okay, so just to um, bring you up to speed on some of the things that have been um, bubbling up around us. Um, we do have quite a number of units. Am I talking too loud? I feel like I'm talking really loud. Uh, we do have quite a number of units in the pipeline, both market rate and affordable units. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about some of that. Um, right now, I, I think I counted up about 381 um, units that are um, really kind of on the table that either have been permitted or in the permit process or that we know about and have been daylighted to the public. Um, and those include things like um, 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, which is going to include 90 um, units altogether with 11 affordable and 79 market rate. Um, Things like uh, Belchertown Road, which we know is our Belchertown Road and the East Street School, which will have at least 40 affordable units, and they may have more than that, and also market rate units. I have a list of these, and I could send it to you, but um, South Point and the Boulders, um, there's a new building that's going to be going up there that's kind of um, hasn't been, uh, you know, as much in the public eye, but that's going to have 47 units. Uh, six of which are affordable and 41 market rate. Um, we have U Drive South, which is a Barry Roberts project. Again, 45 units and five of those are gonna be affordable. So altogether, in, based on my count, we have about 381 total units in the pipeline, 92 of which are gonna be affordable, which I think is pretty good. Um, and then we have other uh, projects that are coming along that, um, you know, we often have developers come to talk to us about projects before they actually submit an application. And usually we don't, um, you know, talk uh, publicly about those projects because they may or may not come to pass. But if we were to consider those projects as well, we have another about 195 units coming along. So by my uh, reckoning, it looks to me like we have about 576 total units in the next few years. And I think that's pretty good. Um, and that does include the affordable units. Um, so I just wanted to let you know about that because you know um, many of these things kind of go by under the radar. They don't get into the Gazette. They, you know, were, they're not really talked about that much. And so um, you know, I just wanted to let you know that there are, there is a substantial number of units coming along. Um, the other thing is that um, we have made efforts to reduce the number of homeless people. Um, for instance, 132 Northampton Road, which is, I forget the name of it, but it's got a, a really lovely name. It has to do with the Gables or something like that. Maybe Nate can tell us about that. But it, that is a project that's going to have 28 units of affordable housing. They're all affordable. And some of them are set aside for formerly homeless people. And they're also set aside for people of very low income of 30% 30, 30 of area median income. So we're really happy about that. And I believe that um, development is either about to receive a building permit or has just received a building permit. We recently had a pre-construction meeting. So they're gonna be starting construction very soon. Um, so that's something to celebrate. And the other thing is that um, our staff, Dave Zomek, and now Nate Malloy is stepping into Dave's shoes to work with the Homelessness and Rehousing Working Group, um, which is going to be staffed by the planning department. And um, they're going to be looking into a permanent home for a congregate shelter. And we're really excited about that too. So Anyway, those are some things that I wanted to bring you up to speed with. The other thing is that we've asked um, for CPAC funding for three years to fund a part-time uh, planning uh, staff member to work with Nate on issues related to um, housing and to uh, really try to increase the number of um, particularly affordable units, but also market rate units, because the more market rate units we have, 
the the less pressure there is on housing in Amherst in general. So I, I think that's really good news, and we're hoping that um, town council approves that funding um, for that uh, staff member. So th those are just some kind of status things that I wanted to tell you about to bring you up to speed. And I did have comments about um, the comprehensive housing policy in particular. And if Mandy Jo would um, would uh, let me go ahead, I could um, talk about some of the bulleted items under Appendix A implementation. Yes, please. Okay. So uh, starting on page 11, um, as you know, uh, we did make an effort to um, look into 40R. We worked with a consultant to um, examine whether 40R would be appropriate in our downtown. Um, we've determined that we're not convinced that it's right for downtown, but we do think it may be appropriate for village centers. So that's something that we're going to be um, considering in the future. And for those of you who don't know what 40R is, it has to do with um, allowing um, modification of zoning requirements in exchange for providing affordable housing. Um, I think Pam is most familiar with this because she was very, uh, she helped us to talk about the chapter 40R project that was uh, proposed for downtown. So anyway, that's still on our radar. Um, accessory dwelling units is the second item that's listed on page 11. And last year we had a great success in getting an accessory dwelling unit zoning bylaw passed, which allows the building commissioner to approve most um, accessory dwelling units without having to go through either the zoning board of appeals or the planning board. Um, so we're really thrilled with that. Going down the page, um, design guidelines. We have $100,000 to work with a consultant. Nate is developing an RFP to hire the consultant, and we're going to be going over that RFP, I think, tomorrow with um, the town manager and Dave Zomek. So we're really moving ahead with that, and that's going to help us with, um, with our new building in the downtown area. At the bottom of page 11, there's an item about duplexes and triplexes. And that's something that we've had on our radar for a long time. And it's one of the items that's on the planning department um, list in under phase two. So low to medium density housing is something that we'd really like to work on. That includes duplexes, triplexes, and also converted dwellings. So taking a single family house and um, turning it into a, a house that has more than one unit. Um, See, going along on the housing policy on page 12, close to the top of the page, the inclusionary zoning bylaw, we can check that off our list. We've already accomplished that and we're really pleased with that. And that's already producing affordable units um, with a lot of the new development that we're seeing. Um, infill development is uh, another one that's um, a little further down the list. Now, that is something that's um, kind of helping us to think about making our existing apartment complexes more dense. In other words, taking places that are already uh, built up and allowing them to be denser. And those would be places like uh, the Boulders and South Point and um, you know, some of our, our larger housing developments. So they're already developed and it makes sense to add development in those places. So those, those are places where um, developers are looking at um, adding units. Um, going down the page, multifamily housing by right. We had a success this past uh, fall in allowing apartments in the RVC zoning district by site plan review. So that was something that um, at least the planning department thought was a, a good addition to our zoning bylaw. So that may provide us with more um, ability to have apartments. On page 13, um, at the top of the page, there's a controversial item at the very top, student housing district. That was something that was mentioned in the housing market study. Um, and the idea was to consider establishing um, an overlay district close to the university that could be um, somehow uh, regulated so that student housing could be built there or operated there and it would be operated in such a way as not to be bothersome to um, the residents of the area. And, and we have received some feedback about that um, from a member of the CRC. Um, 
who is troubled about that, but you know that's something that we can certainly talk about. But it's it's it, it has been something that's been talked about for a while. Um, there was another item that um, also has been talked about in the planning department, and it's not particularly listed on this list, but it does have to do with um, student housing, and that is using some of the larger homes, trying to figure out how to allow the larger homes in town to be um, occupied by more than four uh, people. And um, that's something that Rob Moore is interested in working on. So um, we think that that has the potential for providing more housing. Um, going down the page on page 13, um, community choice aggregation is, a, is an item that's listed under municipal regulatory and policy strategies. So community choice aggregation is something that Stephanie Ciccarello, who's the sustainability coordinator, is already working on with other communities in our area, and she's making good progress on that. So we're hoping that that comes to pass um, fairly soon. Um, encouraging building repair and maintenance. I understand that Rob Mora is working with uh, some town council members on trying to um, improve the status of rental housing and particularly enforcing and strengthening the rental registration bylaw. So that's something that's already in the works and we're hoping that that bears fruit. Um, down at the bottom of the page, mixed income housing. So this is an idea that you can have more than one uh, level of income in particular developments. And we think that our new inclusionary zoning bylaw go goes a long way to um, promoting um, different levels of income uh, people living in the same development. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, as I, I've already talked about people who are homeless and some of the things that we're doing to help them. Um, and then at the bottom of the page, page 13, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, this has to do with preservation of existing affordable housing. There was a big uh, push on several years ago, and Nate Malloy kind of led the led the charge to preserve the affordable housing at Rolling Green. Rolling Green has about 200 units altogether, 40 of which are on the um, state inventory of affordable housing, but um, we get to count all 200 units on our inventory. So that's a really good thing. So preserving those units not only provided uh, to make sure that there are still 40 affordable units available, but it also allows us to um, count all of them on our SHI. Um, let's see, on page 14, um, at the top of the page, regulatory clarity and predictability. I think we've really come a long way since the housing market study was published in 2015 to um, make it clearer to applicants what the requirements are, what the procedures are for getting permitting. And um, Rob and the planning department have worked closely with applicants to help them to get through the permitting process. And I think it's a much less arduous um, process than it was in the past. Um, down the page a bit is rental registration regulation. Again, Rob is working with uh, some counselors on that item. And you may ask him about that later if you want to. Um, page 15, about a third of the way down the page is deed restrictions. It says use affordable housing deed restrictions for affordable housing rental and ownership. We already do that. Um, when affordable housing is built as part of a project, either a comprehensive housing project or another type of project, we already do require deed restrictions to be put in place so that those units remain affordable in perpetuity. Um, let's see, land acquisition, other land acquisition. Um, so uh, we're always thinking about um, how the town can make the most of the property that it already owns and um, keeping an eye out for um, acquisition of property that may really you know, reap a lot of benefits. For instance, the Belcher Town Road properties. Um, when those things went up for sale, uh, people immediately noticed that you know, there were for sale signs out there and we started talking about it internally. Dave brought um, the um, proposal to uh, come up with the CPA funds to purchase that property. I think it was 100 700,000 or something like that. But anyway, that was a really good investment. And now um, we're gonna be reaping the benefit of that uh, with 
affordable housing on Belchertown Road. So we're always um, thinking about that um, and planning for it. Um, let's see, down at the bottom of page 15, staff support. We already talked about the fact that we are asking for additional help in the planning department to um, promote more housing and more affordable housing. Tax increment financing. We have a tax incentive in place that the um, legislature of Massachusetts approved uh, back in, I think it was 2015, I could be wrong about that. But anyway, um, the only developers that have taken advantage of that so far is Beacon Communities, which took advantage of that for the North Square project, but they got a about a $2 million tax incentive um, for the affordable units that they built up there. And um, disposition of town land. And we have town, some town land on Strong Street that Rob and Nate and Dave have been looking at to, and, and also the housing authority, housing trust, excuse me, the housing trust, to figure out whether it's possible to build affordable housing up there. Um, so that would be town owned land that we already own. And what could we do with it to um, increase the number of affordable housing units that we have? And I think that is the end of my uh, presentation, but I just wanted to um, bring you up to speed on these things because I think, you know, this is a very long list um, on Appendix A, but I wanted to let you know that we're already working on several of these items and we've actually accomplished some of them. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And we have Thank Nate you. here who also is uh, very knowledgeable about housing. Thank you for the update. Chris, and thank you, Nate, for joining us and doing so much work on housing in, in town. Um, Pam. Oh, you're muted, Pam. Sometimes you hit it and it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> I was gonna say thank you for the update. Um, it's clear that there is a lot a lot underway. I had a, a question about, um, I was thinking as Chris, you said, you were talking about the um, um, the land acquisitions and, and Strong Street, et cetera. Um, when, the Hap, when Hap built the really nice, I don't know, 12, 20 unit development on Longmeadow Drive down south of Potwine, Potwine Lane, Pomeroy Lane, is that, is that, still town owned land or is that um, on the tax rolls? Does anybody know that? It was a 40, I think it was a 40B project. Chris? It is a 40B project and Nate would probably know more about that than I would. That was, um, yeah, so maybe Nate knows something about that. Sure, Nate? Dave had his hand raised. So it was, I don't think it was ever town owned property. It was a private, privately owned. And so affordable housing is um, it's a nonprofit, so depending on how they set it up, there really aren't, you know, many taxes paid on it. It's, you know, it'd be prorated at best if it was, um, you know, mixed. So, uh, you know, um, you know, so like Olympia Oaks, Butternut Farms, what you mentioned, Pam, those are um, usually wouldn't pay taxes, uh, you know, through inclusionary zoning. If there's, you know, a mix of market rate, uh, and depending on how it's developed, they'll pay taxes on those units. But, you know, certain affordable developments won't pay taxes just because of the way it's structured in terms of ownership and, um, you know, the financing. So, but, you know, Olympia Oaks up on Olympia Drive, that was town-owned property, you know, it took many years to get there, but um, that's something where there's a, a ground lease with HAP and, you know, um, so it's town-owned land and they, they basically, um, you know, own and manage the housing. Got it. Got it. it um, again, as you were talking, it, it occurred to me if there, if there was, um, property that was not something that the town itself wanted to develop, maybe that land could be sold and the and the proceeds could help other projects in other parts of town, you know, in the way we want it to. So just going through my head. Thank you. This is very helpful. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Jennifer. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's a lot that, um, and I appreciate you going, uh, uh, Chris, reviewing all that. So I'm assuming this meeting isn't the time, but uh, <laughs> when we'll be able to discuss uh, some of these items, <laughs> which, um, you know, I mean, just to throw it at, you know, 
having more than four students in the larger houses. I mean, that's a big deal. So, I mean, when when is the opportunity to really, you know, yes. I don't think it's today. It, it is not today, it is coming up, <laughs> right? Um, so, so, so it's a completely valid question. Um, and, and it goes to why is everything in Appendix A? Um, and what is the purpose of Appendix A? Which, which is, I think, where um, I, I wanted to discuss CRC's role in implementation. So Appendix A was in there um, for a number of reasons. Um, we had done as the, 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 the last CRC before this council was inaugurated, spent a lot of time working on the policy, came up with a whole list of implementation strategies and didn't know what to do with it. And then there was a lot of discussion, well, which one should be on it, which one shouldn't. Some people do some, some people do others, you know, in terms of what they like and don't like and wanted on and didn't want on. And in the end, um, CRC made a decision, um, reached consensus that said, we can't narrow that list down and get this policy done in our term because narrowing that list down to finding seven votes on the council to support every single one of them will take an extremely long time potentially. And so in, in coming up with the list, we basically pulled a lot of strategies together, listed them all. And then um, if you read the start of the appendix, it basically says, this is just a list. And it's not necessarily endorsed or that not necessarily everything will be used. And once the policy passes, we'll go in and figure out which ones are best, which ones aren't. And so one of the things I see as part of CRC's role in implementation is to potentially narrow that list down or use help, help, help the planning department, especially on the zoning part of the list, right, um, with a we don't really want to explore that one, or maybe we want to explore this one. And, and that's where I think, Jennifer, it goes into your question about, well, how does the housing policy work with the planning priorities and how do they mesh together, right? And so maybe one of the things that goes into that matrix that Shalini will be drafting is start with the whole list and then we can talk about do we want to just ask some and say, no, we don't, we don't even, we don't think that this strategy is worth talking about for the next two or three years, that it's that low on the priority list, or maybe it comes off the list completely. Um, and so I think as we go through to figure out, you know, Dave was talking about um, in, you know, they need the council's help where implement implementation touches zoning and touches policy, right? The zoning is, um, have help help the planning department figure out which items of zoning under that poly, under this appendix a um the council is interested in pursuing and potentially passing and i say that we as, as chair of crc as a counselor i don't want the planning department to put a lot of time into a measure um, that's on this list that has no chance of garnering the required number of votes at the council. That's not a wise use of staff time. It's not a wise use of council time. And so I think part of our role is to figure out which of those zonings, um, zoning measures that implement the housing policy should be dealt with first and maybe others that don't. And so some of that will require a lot of conversation, Jennifer, um, in particular, potentially that that issue regarding unrelated individuals um, could require a whole lot of conversation um, and things like that. So I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, so eventually when we figure out what we need to discuss, that will be part of that list. Other comments on Jennifer's questions or, or other comments at all? Dave. Yeah, again, I, I think, Mandy, you just kind of referenced something I said earlier, and, and I, I think I'm. you said one of the things as we look at, for instance, the zoning section of the policy, you said, I guess, to paraphrase what I heard you say was, you know, it, it's CRC's job to help the planning department identify maybe those strategies in that section. I guess from where staff is coming from, 
we would kind of look at this and say, you've got an 11 page, 15 page um, uh, policy with a whole bunch of possible implementation um, um, uh, strategies in the appendices. And from where I sit, where Rob and Chris, we see it as our role to say, as the people who actually do the implementation on the ground in, in town and work with developers and nonprofits and, and uh, the housing trust, et cetera, we would kind of look at it as we should identify those strategies that we think have the best chance of success and propose that those are the ones that we should spend the most time on. Um, so it's a little bit of a different, you know, and a little bit of a different way of looking at things. But um, I think going back to what I said a few minutes ago, where the council can help us, I think, is really in the zoning section, in the policy section. And I forgot to add funding. You know, you often are in the position budget wise to vote for funding. And Chris, in her, her very comprehensive um, review of some of the things that we've already done on this list, um, we didn't talk about, um, you know, staff advocating for half a million dollars uh, in CPA funds, which is going to come to you in the, in the budget season, you know, which is fast approaching, um, so that we can have more money to work with to acquire land and to put into projects. Staff also advocated through Paul, and Paul approved the ARPA list, which includes $1 million for homelessness and $1 million for affordable housing. So that's another area where we would look to the council in addition to you know, your support on zoning measures, on policy that supports, in this case, uh, you know, more housing and, and more uh, affordable housing, but also supporting you know, any votes that, that you might take uh, like CPA funding that, that can, can fund these initiatives. So I guess thank you, Dave. Yeah. And, and you, you said you, you brought the other area that I forgot to say or didn't say about figuring out implementation, which is um, we need staff's help because staff's the experts on what will be the most effective or what they believe will be the most effective and what won't necessarily be effective. Um, and, and where I see CRC and the council helping is looking at those and figuring out from the council's point of view, which ones are um, more priority than others. If two will be just as effective, which one would the council like to prioritize one over another potentially? Um, but, but it being a conversation between staff's expertise on um, where the most bang for the buck is in some sense, where what changes will help us achieve our policy that the council set forth the most um, with the council then weighing in on which ones should be done first, second, or third um, based on timing essentially, right? You know, and, and which, of, which of potentially each of the policy goals is more important at any one time. Um, because each of them touch on different policy goals too. Jennifer. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I know when Dave um, said, you know, that the staff, um, you know, who works with the, they know what the staff has the capacity to do, what there's the funding to do and what, you know, in speaking with developers, you know, they maybe can be done. But what I think we, um, the counselors also bring to it is what we're hearing from all the people that live in the community. So, you know, just in, again, I'm not gonna get into particulars, but some things that were mentioned are literally the opposite of what many of us are hearing in our district meetings and in the emails that we get. And that's huge. You know, we can't, we're not, um, you know, so it, there, that part of the conversation, which we, I think there's conversations directly with constituents and then that gets funneled, you know, that, that we're the representatives for, um, that we also can't implement particular policies that are the opposite of what we're hearing that, at, that many we're hearing across town is not actually what people, they're, they're wanting us to do the opposite. I'll just leave it, leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Shalini. 
Kutvi, maybe get a sense of what might be the order of things, because what I'm also hearing is some sort of community engagement that needs to happen. Um, again, we, you know, we hear from different people and then there are other people who are impacted that we don't hear from. And so at what point will we be having a systematic community engagement that, and it feels like there might be competing needs to right of different, um, and which is not to say that's a, it's a challenging thing for sure. But I think that forces us to really look at the issues from different angles and find solutions for them. So is that something that the staff is doing and then presenting to us and then we go and take it out to the community or are we getting a sense from the community and then feeding that to the staff? So like, what is the order of things? Where does the community engagement piece fit in? That is a good question. Um, and why we're having this conversation to identify all of that, to figure out how to implement stuff. Um, I'm looking at the time and I'm cognizant that we have a couple more things to get through. Um, and so what I'm thinking of doing now with this one is, is um, having myself and Pam as chair and vice chair uh, talk with, maybe set up a meeting with Dave and Chris and Rob and Nate or some combination thereof um, to figure out how best to continue this conversation at CRC in a way that is um, meaningful and moves things forward and how long it might take to get to that port point um, with what, what we might need to do that um, to, to figure it out so, so that our next conversation and I think this was a good start to the conversation, but the next one has has def defined goals in mind of where we're trying to go with that particular conversation. Um, and so that obviously wouldn't also be done by the third. Our next meeting is technically in a week. <laughs> and it's very hard to get stuff done in a week. Um, and so, you know, that's where I'm seeing this conversation go is, is to, uh, a meeting, sort of an agenda setting meeting between Pam, myself, and Dave, and planning staff, whoever they think is is best suited for that meeting, to figure out sort of next steps on how we can move that process forward, given the conversation today. And does that sound like, I know it's not a complete plan at all, but does that sound like that would be a good idea to do before we bring this back to CRC um, as, as a way to move forward on, on what has been referred to us? And if I don't see any hands or any conversation, I'm just gonna assume people are okay with that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of nodding. So that, that is going to be the next step that I will get down. Okay. Um, with that, we're going to move on to um, the the next item on the agenda, which is a discussion regarding the GOL conversation on changing the CRC charge. And I will just start with um, before we're going to start with Pam, but I'm going to introduce it a little bit, and then I'll introduce a GOL conversation after Pam talks a little bit, but. Um, Pam Rooney brought a potential proposal to GOL regarding um, committees of the council. Oh, and Nate already left, but thank you, Nate and Rob. They're both gone. Thank you, Chris. I think we're done with you, Chris, too, so that you can go. Thank you. You know, Go and thank Nate and Rob for their time, too. <laughs> I'm always slow in doing that. Um, so thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening, Chris. Um, so Pam brought a potential a, a request when when GOL chair asked for potential rule changes, Pam Rooney brought a request under the rules to look at the standing committees of the council. GOL had a brief conversation um, and part of that conversation resulted in the GOL chair asking the chairs of TSO and CRC to have a brief conversation about their thoughts on the conversation GOL had um, regarding the charges specifically related to their own committees, which is CRC here um, and, 
and TSO would be another one. And so I added this to the agenda item. There are some drafts. Uh, Pam's initial proposal or thoughts on proposal is in the packet. Um, there was a draft charge. I will say that I did that um, in order to help the GOL chair based on GOL conversations. It has not been seen by GOL. It is not the GOL proposal, but it helps um, show sort of what um, one result of uh, the implementation of potentially what Pam had proposed would look like for CRC. And so I, I put it in there simply to um, help people think about what the changes might be, um, but that is not necessarily what, GOL has not seen that document yet, I, I will say that. Um, so Pam, do you wanna start with that? And then I'll, I'll, I'll go back to what GOL's conversation was, Pam. Yeah, really, really briefly, the, the intent was to, um, you know, coming in as a new person, what are the responsibilities of the different committees? And my initial reaction was that it, it didn't make as much sense to me to, to have uh, sustainability uh, under, the, under the purview of CRC and perhaps uh, economic vitality and, uh, and marketing kind of a thing. So my recommendation was to simply talk about were there other um, more logical places for this kind of thinking and priority setting to be other than a group that focuses heavily on zoning, um, you know, housing and homelessness. Um, it, was, it was just more what's the better fit. And I understand that because of uh, committee structure and, and even staff support to try to make all these keep these balls in the air. Um, it is just a conversation. It's by no means um, something that, you know, I'm gonna fall on my sword over, but it just made some sense to me. And maybe, and maybe Mandy Joe can talk now about what they actually talked about in GOL. Yeah, so, so thank you, Pam. GOL had a brief discussion. Uh, three of CRC members are on GOL, so the only two that haven't really ha heard this are Shalini and Pam, but I, I briefed Pam on the GOL discussion as we were talking about this item, so Shalini's the one that's sort of in the dark. Um, but GOL discussed the, the items and discussed more than just the changes to the charge, but basically GOL reached sort of I don't want to say consensus because, as I said, GOL has not made any decisions yet. But, but thought that a creating a fifth council committee that deals with um, that dealt with the economic development um, and arts and culture and sustainability from the CRC charge and also from the TSO charge, uh, higher education, um, and there was one other thing from the TSO charge. Um, that I forget what it was. Oh, outreach, the actual outreach portion of TSO um, into a fifth council committee, um, at least on its face, made potential sense in that those items in the past council seem to have gotten um, less attention within TSO and within CRC, potentially because the item, other items within those, char those two committees requires so much attention and that potentially creating a fifth committee um, with those items might allow the council um, to not leave those items unfocused, um, give some, some conversation and some time to those items. There were other parts of that conversation, which is why I say GOL has made no decisions um, that relate to can there be be a fifth committee with sustainable council timing and stuff like that um, and, and things that aren't really a part of our conversation today, which was more of a request to say, hey, what does CRC feel about if um, GOL would make a recommendation to remove X, Y, and Z parts of their charge from their charge? And, and I had actually requested these conversations happen because the last time GOL made a major change to committees, it did not reach out to the committees that were mostly affected. And it heard a lot from those committees that said, hey, you didn't talk to us. <laughs> and they were not happy that 
GOL did not talk to the committees that were mostly affected before that recommendation was made. And so that's the point of this conversation is to say, GOL's considering this, what does CRC think about the potential removal of these items? Does CRC think it might be good, might be bad, what problems they might foresee, uh, things like that. So that's the conversation we're trying to have today. Um, Jennifer. Yes, I also, I just want to add that um, it was discussed, like as Mandy said, what is the bandwidth for, you know, adding another committee? Um, and there was a concern that if we couldn't really reduce the size of the committees, because if there's three on the committee, then if two, two can't speak, or it's in violation of open meeting law, um, which doesn't mean we couldn't maybe form another committee of five, but that's the concern about having more committees with fewer people on them. Um, but then we also discussed like, let's say arts and culture is part of the CRC charge. And would that be appropriate maybe moving that to TSO? Um, so I, if it's, if we, I guess just my thoughts are that if it's determined that it's not realistic to create another committee, then maybe we could take some of the, the charges in the CRC job description that we don't tend to address a lot and that may not really belong in zoning planning and land use and move that to another committee, as Mandy said. And then I also had raised in GOL, I had a concern and it's, you know, again, also not the sort I wanna die on, but that as somebody who was, when I, you know, a couple months ago was just a member of the public, I know when the committees were first started, I, the community resources committee didn't sound to me like anything that the committee did. So if I was looking, you know, I want to know well, what committee is addressing zoning and land use, I would never think of looking at the CRC, just community resources committee. So I think we might think about changing our name just so it sounds a little more like what we really do. It, it might, seems like it would be, might be more transparent. Thank you for that, Jennifer. I completely forgot about the name change and this committee might be the best one to suggest a name if they have one. <laughs> Shalini. So first off, I would say that this potential committee is the ideal committee I would want to join. It has outreach, it has economic development, it has sustainability, I'm in. That's the one I want to join. Um, my only concern again is I, I would have to drop out of if we did create another committee i would drop out of tso probably to join this one and then how does how are we gonna make it sustainable without making it smaller committees that's my big question and then the second thing though is when i think of crc whatever the name is going to be i really do see it more comprehensively as the planning and development piece and and to me, zoning and sustainability and economic development are all interrelated. Um, that be, so when we decide on zoning and where housing is and the densities and close to transportation and all of those, those are things that impact climate change goals and our economic development goals. So I see that they're all really interconnected. But then I can also see sustainability being connected with transportation. The TSO committee, when we're talking about bike lanes and pathways so people feel comfortable biking and walking and using sidewalks. So it almost feels like sustainability is infused or should be. That's a lens we bring and social justice lens that we bring to all many committees. But that being said, then the I guess the thing is that if you're really just focusing on a committee that would be not just using the lens, but actually working on economic development, then yeah, then that's a, definitely something to think about or a committee that would actively be working to push for bylaws related to sustainability and working with ECAC closely. So yeah, if you're thinking that it does make sense to have a third committee and please sign me up for it. Thanks. Other thoughts? Pam. Yeah, I was disabled. So if she's leaving TSO, I could I could pick up her TSO slot. We could 
<laughs> we could we could start moving things around a little bit. Um, it it felt that um, that there were some unaddressed topics, and they and they I, it just feels like they they do fall through the cracks a fair amount. So it's um, I think it's a good discussion. You know, it may end up just the way it is, maybe with a name change, which I think. Thank you, Jennifer. That would be a great idea. Um, but anyway, it's just to get to get us thinking about um, there. I think all I think all of these committees have information and responsibilities that overlap and that are interactive. Um, so again, it's just sort of how do you do you lump them or do you split them, and and um, do we create something that has um, that, that can actively focus on those elements that we aren't covering very well. So that's, that's that was my thinking. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, um, I mean, I, it may not be that important, but has, the, has arts and culture ever come up with CRC? Because that's in uh, the description. It's in the description of the purpose, and then it's not specifically listed in the charge. It would be included in the economic development part of the charge, and it has, I, and this was the comment I was going to make, which is there are parts of the charge that we've never really specifically dealt with. And I say specifically, like we had a comprehensive housing policy. We dealt with housing. We just had a conversation about housing and that's going to continue. We've done a lot of zoning and planning because that's where any zoning amendment comes. We were the ones looking through the master plan and making recommendations on that. There's never been a formal, I, my under, I, if my memory serves me correctly, there has not been a formal referral related to economic development or sustainability to the CRC um, at any time in the last three years in the first council. Um, and the CRC has not had specific conversations related to either one of those during those three years. Arts and culture and economic development came up as conversations in reviewing specific zoning proposals um, and potential zoning priorities of specifically related to the downtown, but that it was more as a peripheral related to zoning conversation than what can we do to specifically improve or encourage economic development. So. Yeah, so what I was going to say is having been on CRC for two and a half years now um, and seeing that um, there's a couple of things, seeing those items don't tend to have things that come through referrals, those two specific items don't have things that come through referrals, um, ECAC exists to deal with in some sense, the sustainability stuff so Shalini's right, we need to be looking at that lens, but um, I'm, I don't even know whether we'll ever deal with specific sustainability referrals in the council. Um, we could. Um, there was a question as to what to do with the CARP plan at one point and what to do with it, right? Um, and so CRC was really busy. And as we've seen from just these conversations, once those referrals on zoning start coming, because of the hearings and all, we get even busier. Um, and we know a bunch of them are coming. And so there may not be time in CRC to deal with them. And so that in my mind favors from a CRC point of view saying, if we really want to have council committee conversations related to economic development, focused on economic development, it probably, CRC probably doesn't have the time to do so. And so a, a, moving that to a different committee that has the time makes logical sense. Um, so from a CRC point of view, I think these proposals make logical sense. From a GOL point of view, which we're not here to discuss the GOL, I'm concerned about um, council time and all, which is a GOL issue, not really a CRC issue. Uh, so that, those are my initial thoughts on this proposal that from my CRC lens, I think it makes sense personally. Other thoughts? Dave, did you have your hand raised? No, okay, you popped to the top of mine and that just could have been a reordering of the windows. <laughs> C 
seeing no other com uh, thoughts on this one, I will relay these thoughts to the GOL chair as thoughts from CRC members using their CRC lens. Um, I never intended us to take a vote or do anything formal on this. It's just a way for GOL to get an idea of what the committee thinks about the potential of removing them. So I will let the chair of GOL know about these thoughts. Um, with that, I think we are on to general public comments. So at this point in time, I'm going to pass the gavel on to Pam Rooney to finish out the running of this meeting. I will be on until I don't have to be. Um, I'm hoping we're done before 6.30, given the time, Pam. <laughs> but, um, but Pam, take away the rest of the meeting. Well, I was going to open it up to general public comment. And I'm looking at the participant list and I don't see any general public. So I think we can conclude that that section is done, which is terrific. Um, item number six is minutes. And we have, thank you very much, Athena. The January 10, January 27 and February 3 meeting minutes. And I want to ask if there are any changes or corrections. Um, I am now a little bit stuck because I was going to be doing this on my town laptop and um, that wasn't allowing me in. So I don't have actual access to the Word doc that Athena sent out, but I will just at least ask the question again, were there any changes or corrections that need to be made to the January 10 meeting minutes? That was the long, that was the long um, public hearing. Jennifer. Okay, it's just a typo, <laughs> but um, I guess the, meeting, the minutes were excellent, but on the middle of um, page three, where it's uh, Alyssa Campbell's comment, it says reaching new zero, and that was just net zero. Yeah. So it says Alyssa Campbell, Yeah. And since Pam doesn't have access to hers, Thank I'll you. I'll send them off to you, Pam. <laughs> Thank you very much. Apologize for that. No, no, that just I it happens to all of us. I was like, yeah. Any any other changes or corrections um, to these minutes? Seeing none. Um, are there any changes or corrections? to the January 27 meeting minutes. I lost Jennifer, um, I lost her face. Really? Uh, I think she's just down below the screen, sorry. Oh. It was my, my <laughs> narrow base. No, they're, I thought they were excellent. Okay, and, and how about February 3 then? Any changes or corrections? Seeing none, um, I will make a motion that we um, adopt these meeting minutes as as is and or as um, modified or corrected, uh, which is the January 10 with a typo, that they are um, adopted as of today, the 24th of February. Any seconds? Uh, second. Jennifer, second. Jennifer, second. All in favor, let's go through the list. Mandy Job. Aye. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Pam Rooney, yes. Um, I think that does it for meeting minutes, right? Um, any announcements? We'll, we'll zoom in on Dave Zomek. Nope, okay. Mandy Joe, any, oh, I'm sorry, Shalini. Uh, I don't know if this comes here, but I had a question about um, inviting ECAC to our committee, or are we inviting them to town council, or are we inviting them to TSO or all of the above? Okay, and this is more in specifically speaking to how 
uh, like how the carp might be relevant because there are some bylaw uh, bylaw suggestions in the carp plan that might have an overlap with zoning. So do we want them to, because um, I know that the, it's a really solid report and it's just out there. And maybe I think it's something that the whole town council should be hearing and then we can decide which committee it goes to. Uh, I'm going to look at Mandy Joe for that. Um, I'll try. Th yeah, <laughs> I'll try, Pam. I think the council sent the carp off to the manager for implementation. Um, uh, Dave might know better than me. Um, that my memory is the council isn't the one in charge of implementing carp. Um, but I'll, I can put it on a list to see, to talk with Lynn about what's up with CARP, um, and, and what's going on with that for it. Cause it, I'm not sure what was ever fully decided once it was presented to the council. Athena. Athena. Um, if, if I may. <laughs> Um, the council voted on September 27th to acknowledge receipt of the CARP um, and to thank the committee. And then they voted to ask the town manager to up the, update the town council quarterly regarding achieving the climate action goals. And that's it. So it sounds like the next step would be for for the town manager then to report back to the full town council, then not necessarily to DRC or TSO. I believe it's in the town manager goals as well. Okay, okay. I have a follow up question. So I think I might have misheard. It might not be the CARP. When I attended one of the ECAC meetings in November one, I think it might be the annual report that they wanted to present to town council. And uh, it was said that um, that they would speak with Len, and then I my understanding is that the understanding was that they will present to the because it was so close to the end of the year, and so the understanding was that the general report would be presented to the whole council once we had the new council in place. So maybe it's more for, and what I'm thinking is specific bylaw recommendations in CARP, maybe that's an individual counselor thing that if we want to bring it forward, is that right? Athena, you've got your hand up again. The ECAC annual report was in a recent council packet and I believe that the president's intention was to invite the ECAC to give a brief verbal report at an upcoming council meeting. Okay, great. Yeah, maybe that was the one I was talking to. Thank you. Thanks, Athena. That's helpful. So that sounds like it's a, your concern is addressed. It will show up in town council ECAC report. Okay. Good. Good. Um, any other any other um, potential agenda items? I'm going, to bring, I'm going to bring one up, and that is um, just a, sort of the ongoing discussion that ties pretty closely in with uh, the housing policy, and that is uh, the formation of some sort of research slash work group slash task force that tries to um, sort of tie some of the loose ends together on all of the facets that uh, affect housing availability in Amherst. And it's, it's just something that um, I'm hoping that we can sort of put together and, and based on you know, much of the information that comes out of the housing policy itself, as, as well as Amherst Housing Trust, Amherst Housing Authority, um, you know, what are the factors that Amherst as a, as a town can address, whether it's by way of zoning bylaws or rental permitting, or um, other aspects of um, maintaining housing availability for our families. So that's kind of in a nutshell. At some point, going to get talked about. 
Andy Joe, and then Jennifer. So I was just going to suggest maybe that we cancel the March 3rd meeting because given the conversations today and all, it's going to take more than a week um, to get stuff put together. And I don't believe there's any referrals coming from the council on the 28th that we need to hold a meeting, but that's just a potential suggestion of freeing up some time if the committee's willing to, but Jennifer might have a topic for next week that we could deal with. Um, Jennifer. No, no, I was just going to add actually to what you just suggested, because I think, you know, that that may also be a way since Shalini, you know, and I had touched on getting some community input that the task force is, is also a way to mm -hmm. make that happen. Yes, I, I do think it's a, a good idea since we, we can't, you know, just what the list that Chris went through today, it's so much and we just can't really address it, you know, have a robust discussion on each one that could take up all of our CRC meetings, I think for the rest of the year. So I, I think a task force might be the way to be inclusive and to really be able to delve in to so much that's in the comprehensive housing policy. Shalini, any, any thoughts? David? Um, yeah, yeah, my only, my only question was really, I'm not aware how the council forms a task force. So that might be a question for Lynn. Um, I don't know how that, how that happens. I know the town manager can appoint, can appoint a working group or a task force, I think on his own, but I don't know how the council does that and whether the charter allows for the council to form a, a, a task force, I just don't know. Mandy knows more about the charter than, than most people. <laughs> so I would defer to her. Mandy and then Jennifer. So um, as long as it's considered a committee, just like we formed ECAC or um, is uh, we might've formed another one, but we formed committees in the past. So a committee, a task force is a committee, it's a multiple member body. Um, so the council or the manager can form them. The manager, depending on whether it's a council committee or whether it's a town committee, meaning a subcommittee of the council or not, it depends on who would appoint the members. A town committee would be appointed by the manager. A subcommittee of the council would be appointed by the president, but it would be a vote of the council. Thanks, Jennifer. So how was the um, CSWG formed? The Community Services Working Group. Sandy. The manager formed that and adopted the charge and then appointed committee members. At the request of the council? I don't know whether the council made a formal request or not. I think the council said we want to see a program and this was the way he did it, I think. Mm. <laughs> Shalini might know better. Yeah, yeah no. because I was the one who proposed that we form a committee because it was, you know, at that time, uh, a request for defunding the police. And what I, I and, and many counselors agreed was that instead we need a committee that would study and we would have a timeline by which they would study and then make a recommendation. So that's how we asked Paul then to form a committee. And I don't know if it was a vote or not, but. That's, that's a discussion anyways. Thanks. Jennifer? And then um, did, um, did anyone from work with him in terms of how people were selected or who was selected or that he? Not from the council. Um, right. Paul has, Paul created his own um, sort of interviewing group to interview candidates. Um, mm -hmm. And then as the charter requires, he selected 
some members, those members then came to TSO for formal confirmation as, as we're doing Monday's agenda, I think has like six different committees we're confirming candidates for per the charter, but it, everything else fell the charter. Um, and he, he formed an interview group himself. The council was not involved other than its required charter confirmation. This does seem to move pretty quickly. That whole. Right. It did. It was very successful. So it's 625. We, we aren't going to solve that one tonight. We, um, Mandy Joe has five minutes to get a drink of water and move to her next meeting. Um, I, I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Are, are we, are we officially canceling the March 3rd meeting? Oh, should we vote on that? We all nodded by consensus. Yeah. So I think people nodded. So Athena, I think I'm going to not hold the March 3rd meeting. Our next meeting will be three weeks from now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for clarifying that. So we are adjourning the meeting at 6.25 um, p.m. Thank you, Mandy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. thank you, Athena and David. Yes, thank you. Thank Good you. night. Good night.